Good morning. I want to take a moment before we started to just say thank you to everyone who not only showed up for the work day yesterday, but shows up during the year, the months and weeks. I know a lot of what you do here goes unnoticed. There's not many opportunities for getting up on the stage and being recognized, and many of you don't ever want that anyway. Uh, some of us like a little recognition, but we know that in a church there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. So before we jumped into the message, I, just, I was just overwhelmed with what all this church has done even since I've been here and what this church has been through and continues to do to pull together as a family. So I just wanted to take a moment to appreciate you all as a church and just encourage you that from what I have seen and the patterns of relationship here, uh, you guys are a testimony not only to the world around us, but I would even say other churches around us as well, an example of what it means to be a family. So thank you for your willingness, your vulnerability, your openness, your hospitality, uh, and I just encourage you to keep up, keep up the good work. And I thought of you all as I was putting together the message this week, which was unlimited family, unlimited family. Who's your family? Who's your family? Do you think of your blood relatives, perhaps? Or maybe you think of a circle of friends, your family that you've built, those you've chosen to be your family, those you are the most open with, the most vulnerable. You know those people will drop anything to do anything for you at a moment's notice. As the great philosopher Tracy Bird pointed out, you find out who your friends are. Well, one thing that reveals this are tragic events, unfortunately, natural disasters. During the last month, our nation has seen an unprecedented increase in both tornadoes and flooding. Now, I know we're used to hearing about tornadoes in the Midwest and, and flooding, and this is a part of our cycle of things, but uh, just, just take a look up here on the screen. I've got the National Weather Service or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association has a, a, compile, a compilation of the number of tornadoes which have been reported between 1989 and 2013. This is a composite average of each state. Texas averages 43, Oklahoma 27, Kansas 36. However, this specific image up here shows that just during the month of May 2019, 80 in Kansas, 61 in Oklahoma, 86 in Texas. And some of those numbers have tweaked even since this image was published. In just 12 days, last week ended a 12-day streak with 225 tornadoes reported across the nation. Those numbers continue to fluctuate and go higher, but in those 12 days, 225 tornadoes. So the amount of cleanup and devastation right now continues to reveal to people who their real family is, who their true neighbors are. They meet new people and find out there's a level of caring that goes beyond the surface. Sometimes, unfortunately, you just don't find out until something like this happens. We're living in unprecedented times. It's not just the weather. You can look around and see there's many things going on that are just a repeat of the cycle of history, but there's some other things happening in current events. You think of the shootings in Virginia this week. The families devastated. The communities devastated by this kind of intense violence. Have there been shootings and murders before? If we took away all the guns, would people probably still use sharpened pencils to kill each other? Sure. But there's something different, though. You've got to admit there's something different going on. We are living in unprecedented times. So who's your family? If the times are so uncertain and things are that scary, and I, I'm, you don't even have to be a fear monger to be alarmed at some of the things going on. You can use common sense and say we are living in unprecedented times. We're living in, un in dangerous times. Are we told to hide away? Of course not. That's not the biblical worldview. That's not a Christian worldview. Jesus didn't encourage us to build a spiritual storm shelter and hide away with a year's supply of food, which I want to do on the weekends. He didn't tell us to hide. He told us to participate and be an active part of change in our community. 
So this morning we're going to talk about unlimited family. God offers us unlimited family to walk through both the joys and the trials of this life. Are you a part of it? Do you appreciate your unlimited family? Have you recognized them? Are you investing into your unlimited family? You know, we have these mountains up here to represent the obstacles that we're going to go over in life. And right now, we're talking about our misunderstanding of God. And we've talked about the obstacles uh, that we face and how God gives us resources and He gives us mission to get through this life. Because sometimes we overpack. We've got to unpack our life and only put into our life those things that God has given us as a gift for our journey. So I want to talk about family this morning. That's something we can pack into our life. This morning, I'm going to use a water bottle to represent family, and I'll tell you why. Because we need family to sustain our journey. There's been a couple times I've taken long hikes without water, and let me tell you, there wasn't much sustenance by the end of it. I looked pretty pathetic. I was looking around, and I'm like, I hope nobody I know is on this trail, because I look like I'm dying. There's something different about being hydrated, having the water and refreshment available. When you have family and friends who can speak into your life and just even keep their mouths shut and just be present in your life, there's something sustaining and refreshing about that. And they say, Mike, I don't know if I like this because Jesus said he was the living water. Yes, and how does Jesus act that out? By being present in our lives through our church family and through our friends and family that we love. They are a source of refreshment. You say, Mike, not mine. Mine's kind of a source of a drain. They're kind of a drain, Mike. They kind of dry me out. Okay, again, I'm asking who your family is. It may not be your blood relatives. And if you find that debatable, good. You've got a brain. You can think for yourself. I believe in Scripture we see that God is building a different family. Sometimes it includes your, bro- your blood relatives, and praise the Lord when it does. When you have blood relatives who support your walk with God, and you can feed into them, and they can feed into you, well, praise the Lord. That's a blessing, but that doesn't always happen, does it? We overpack our lives with any and every substitute for genuine relationship and honest conversations. We seek advice from people on a screen rather than listening to the life experience of the family that God's given us. When the family that God's given us has advice that's inconvenient, we'll turn to other sources. Now, Tali, if you go to slide number four, I've got a screen up here that depicts the different types of family that exist. Because when I say family, perhaps you think of the Traditional nuclear family from the 1950s. I don't mean nuclears and they blew up at each other. I mean nuclear family unit. A traditional family structure. And you say, yeah, we don't have that much anymore. We've never had that. That has been a facade that we've created that sometimes we're more perfect than others and the family unit used to always look like this. No, it didn't. I hope you're not buying into that. They're all, you go through the Old Testament, you go through the New Testament, and you go through history with an honest, objective lens, and you find out there has never been a perfect family structure. If you're here this morning, and the, all you can think of is, I come from a dysfunctional family, join the club. Join the club. My mom's going to be here this weekend. She's staying with us for a month. Praise the Lord. (laughs) I'm excited. I'm glad she's coming to help. It'll be a big help, but guess what? We got to set boundaries. And yes, Mom, I know you might be watching this on YouTube later. We've already had this conversation. We're open and honest with each other because you know as well as I do, family can be just as much of a drain as a blessing if you don't set the right boundaries and if you're not surrounded by people who feed into you. God's given you a family who can feed into you. When Olivia and I, again, and I'll probably reference this as, as I preach throughout this year, when we lost my father-in-law, but as Olivia lost her dad, one of the things, you know, we're out there in East Tennessee, and several times we, we were surrounded by good Christian people out there and church families we'd had from before, but we kept saying, it'll be good to get back home. It'll be good to get back home here to our church family. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. There was a part of us that was waiting to heal till we could get back around where our mission and where our love and where our ministry is right here. This is our church family. 
God's given you a church family. Maybe you haven't found it yet. Maybe you're just visiting this morning because uh, you, you want to uh, grow with God. You want to hear his word and you have that hunger. But maybe you're not here because you've found a family and that's fine. You're welcome. You're welcome to join us. Hang out. Maybe we're not supposed to be your church family. There's different pockets of God's family all around. We're not the only one. But God has a family for you. He has a family unit for you to be committed to and for them to be committed to you too. There is that family relationship out there. You say, Mike, this just kind of sounds like talk. What does the Bible have to say about it? I'm so glad you asked. Let's go to Mark chapter 3. That was a good question. That was a good question. You guys are sharp. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. We'll get to that here in just a second. See, Jesus, while he was here on this earth, and he was teaching the truth of God, people were coming to him because they wanted, because they said Jesus spoke with authority. Man, this guy knew what he was talking about, and he was really giving it to the system. He's like, we don't need to follow all these religious leaders and all these hypocrites. He's like, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. We're going to go find people. We're going to change the world. We're going to bring the kingdom of heaven here to earth, and people are going to getting pumped, saying it's about time. So the paparazzi's closing in. Jesus is now a certified Twitter user. He's got a certified account now. I'm just kidding. He didn't use Twitter. Some of you are checking. Don't check. No, Jesus doesn't have a Twitter account. He said everything he needed to say in the Bible. That's enough. Everybody's closing in on him. And his, and his family's kind of liking some of this popularity all of a sudden. So his mom and his brothers show up because they want to get in and just kind of see what's going on. I'm not saying they had bad intentions, but they just wanted to see him. And uh, in Mark chapter 3, verse 30, uh, 31 through 35, we get this beautiful scene of what makes God's family. Would you mind, just out of respect for the reading of the word, would you mind standing with me as we read Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35? We'll have it up on the screen. You could use a mobile device or use your Bible. Uh, Mark chapter 31, verses 31 through 35. Jesus' mother and brothers came and stood outside. They sent someone in to get him. A crowd was sitting around Jesus and they told him, your mother and your brothers are outside. They're looking for you. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? He asked. Jesus being a little sarcastic here. Who are my brothers? Then Jesus looked at the people sitting in a circle around him and he said, here's my mother. Here are my brothers. Anyone who does what God wants is my brother or sister or mother. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, I pray as we listen to your word, myself included, as we listen to your words, I pray that what comes out in our lives is not just an attendance inside of a church building, but an acceptance of your truth, an action on your truth, so that people will know we're Christians, not because of our church attendance, not because of our church denomination, not because of our church movement, not because we have a nice facility. People will know we're Christians by our love. I pray that we accept not just love in a general term, but we accept your love this morning for your family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So rising above our personal perspective of what makes a family is God's definition of a family, and he says, it's those who do what my father wants. No big deal. Pressure's off. We've got it now. Whatever God wants us to do, we do. Simple enough. Lunchtime. Or if you give me just a few more minutes, we break down what that actually means. See, Jesus warned us against ever making family an idol over our life. You know family can be an idol, right? Are, are you willing to admit that? That family can be something you worship. Family can be something that holds you back. Family can be a voice of manipulation. Family can be an action of abuse. Family can be abrasive. Family can be overbearing. Do we want to make a list? We can make a list. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus went a little bit further on this teaching. Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 22, Jesus said, When Jesus saw these large crowds approaching him, 
He gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. A scribe approached him and said, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. That sounds simple enough. Let's follow Jesus wherever he goes. Jesus told him in verse 20, Foxes have dens and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Verse 21, Lord, another one of his disciples said, Let me first go bury my father. And Jesus told him, Follow me. Let the bed, dead bury their dead. Boy, that's messed up. Excuse me, Jesus, hold on, I'll go on your mission thing with you. I, I want to follow you, but first I've, I've got a memorial service for my dad. And Jesus said, don't worry about that, you're coming with me. Those people are lost without me, let them all die. Like, Whoa, this isn't cool Jesus or sweet Jesus, this is intense Jesus. This is intense. Let the be dead bury their dead. But listen, this is a truth that was spoken that our family, when we choose to follow Jesus Christ, we're given not only a new life, not just a new nature, we're also given a new family. Have you accepted that truth? When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were given a new family. And sometimes they cross paths. Don't get confused with that for a minute. Don't, don't, just for a second, put that aside. Put your biological family aside for a second because guess what? I have a mother and father who also know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, so they are now, they still remain a part of that family. So how does that work? How does that work? Because to have unlimited family is a part of being refreshed. So does that mean when we receive our new family, we can now flip our old family the bird and do whatever we want to do now because we don't have to listen to them. We don't have to build relationship with them. We don't have to answer the tough questions with them. We don't need to spend any time with them because guess what? We got a new family. See you later. It's been great. That's not the picture Jesus gives though. He is saying, if you follow me, you can't let your biological family determine your life from here on out. Here's the ugly truth. I now have a greater responsibility to build relationship with my biological family now that I'm in the family of God. To build healthy relationship. We could break that topic down all day. We could go from marriages to divorce and remarriages to stepchildren to adoptive children to foster children to grandparents raising grandchildren to single parent homes. To... We could break this down all day. Adult children in the homes. We, we could go around and around and around on this subject. I want to say to, to center you on one truth, to center you on one truth, let's go back to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 3. He who does the will of my Father, those are my mother, brothers, and sisters. Let's go back to that. Let's focus on that. Because there's another inconvenient truth in all of this. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 17 blurts out, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. In other words, there is some health in some of the friction we experience in our relationships. When we get a little pushback, when we have rubbing people the wrong way, sometimes that is a healthy process whereby we become a sharper instrument, we become more polished, we become more presentable, we grow, we mature. Sometimes that, that healthy friction is a part of it. So you can't use this passage as an excuse to reject your family. This passage is intended to draw our focus on our one true family. I can tell you right now, this church family, just in the last six months, has already walked with me in my life in a way that my parents never have, my siblings never have. There's already been a relationship that is built on a deeper and more unique level than my family's experience with me. You all have already been integrated into our lives as family, and it's not even been a year. So where are you at in your walk with your family, with your church family? Let me ask you that. Again, we're focusing on the family of Christ this morning. Have you been open and vulnerable with your unlimited family? Because I tell you it's unlimited. Why? Because the church is unlimited and the entire church is your family. That's what I'm saying. So if you're thinking, Mike, I'm kind of running on fumes. I'm getting dry. Okay. 
you got unlimited family. You have no excuse. You can seek out other relationships. You can seek out other believers. I know that's the hard part, and I know that's awkward, and I know that's uncomfortable, but listen, so is carrying water in your backpack when you're hiking. That can get heavy. That can get awkward, but it's life-saving. Who's your family? We like it when we see the news stories about a tragedy that unfolds and people come together. That's one thing I always hear. All oh, but the people came together. All oh, but look at how they helped each other out. And I, and I just got to ask, why do we wait till a storm to do that? Why do we wait? We're willing to, we're willing to literally cross in a neighbor's yards and say, hey, you're doing okay? I mean, we'll, we'll go in the house too. We won't even knock on the door. You okay? We had a tornado pass through. You all right? We'll kick in the door. But we're afraid to even contact each other before the storm because, oh, well, they might resent me for it. Let them resent you for it. Find out who really likes you. Find out who resents you for reaching out to them and find out those who are willing to cross some uncomfortable boundaries just because they want a relationship with you. Take that chance. Take that risk. Take it. Anyone who does what God wants is my brother, sister, or mother. I'll never forget, I was about... Nine years old, we were at Walmart, of course. And in the Walmart, there was a McDonald's. And I had my sad meal. They never let us get Happy Meals growing up. My $1 cheeseburger, no fries, no soda, just water. I passed that tradition along to my kids, too. As, I, as I finished my sad meal... I saw a man sitting by himself, catty cornered from me. I was with the family. There was just five of us kids, just a small little crowd. I looked over and I saw a man sitting by himself at the table and I was like, I need to go tell him about Jesus. So without telling anybody, I just got up, left my sad meal by itself. I wasn't traumatized by this at all. I went over and talked to the man and I just sat down. I didn't even ask him. I just sat down at the booth. And I said, do you know you're a sinner going to hell? <laughs> and he looked up at me and he said, yes, I do. I said, do you know that Jesus died for your sins? He said, yes, I do. I'm a Christian. I said, good. I said, I thought God was telling me you were going to hell. And he said, well, thank you for telling me. What else do you know about Jesus? And we took off on this conversation. I took a risk. But I learned a very valuable lesson. Although, hopefully, I've learned to polish my words a little better. I learned a valuable lesson. As brash and as harsh as I came off, he saw through to a truth that he identified with, and immediately we were family. Now, some punk nine-year-old at McDonald's and Walmart eating a sad meal can do that. I'm going to ask you, would you be willing to take that risk to find new family members this week, this month? I'm, this isn't an urgent challenge, or is it? Would you be willing to do that? I'm not talking about just a weekly challenge. I mean, think about it as a life change to make new connections before the storms hit, before the next shooting happens, before there's another tragic auto accident, before... We get another terrible headline. Why don't we make some of those family members meet some of them now? First Peter gives some urgency here. Because before you start into the fear factor, and I don't know if I have the right words, and I, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of an introvert. Can I, can I reveal a secret to you? I am an introvert. I am an introvert. I am energized when nobody's around me. Whenever we get ready to go somewhere, I secretly hope the event is canceled. <laughs> and I always end up having a great time, and I love it, and I'm always like, oh, man, oh, that was so great, and... Olivia's like, I thought you just said you hoped it would get canceled. I, there's an anxiety there. Sue me. No, don't. Oh, this is on camera now. Don't sue me. I, I'm an introvert by nature. 
but I've had to learn how important it is that we reach out because I need to be fed into just as much as I need to feed others. I have to feed you. I need to share with you what God's showing me, whether I've got a microphone and a lectern or we're sharing coffee or we're working a project together. I need to share with you my struggles, my burdens, and my insights, and I need to hear from you your struggles, your victories, and your insights. I need that. We need that just as much as we need water and to be refreshed and to refresh others. So if we're going to refresh, what's required to do that as we close this morning? What is required? What is required to be a part of this family? What is required to be a part of this refreshing? What is required? 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. What's required is to do what God wants. That's easy, right? So what does God want? 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you. Listen to this. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Back up. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You thought I was going to give you another list, didn't you? Do the will of God, and I can give you a list. Buy my book for $9.99 on Amazon, and you'll find out everything God wants you ever to do in your life. I don't have a book on Amazon. They wouldn't publish it. Anyway, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 says that what God wants is for no one to perish and for everyone to repent. It's that simple. Is that what you want? I'm asking you. You don't need to nod your head. You don't need to raise your hand. Think about it. Ask yourself that question. Is that your desire? Do you want what God wants? Do you want to see people saved? We're going to keep it simple this morning. We're going to keep it very simple because I believe God keeps it simple. We make it complicated so we can sell books, so we can be public speakers, so we can try and say things that sound deep. I believe God keeps it simple. At your heart of hearts, do you want to see people liberated from injustice? In your heart of hearts, do you want to see people saved from death? In your heart of hearts, do you want to see people saved from their sins and covered by the blood of Christ so you can see them in heaven one day? Is that your mission? Is that at the core of who you are? If it is, then you're a part of God's family. I'm going to say something controversial before I close because, of course, I have to. We get caught up in what kind of prayer, the baptism, the words, the thing. I'm going to say something controversial that I see in Scripture, and that is when you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are now a part of God's family. As a member of God's family, you get baptized. As a member of God's family, you start committing yourself to a church. As a member of God's family, you do what God wants you to do. He didn't say those who believe what God believes. He said those who do what God calls them to do. Those who do the will of my Father. God's will is that we see people come to repentance, turn their lives around for Him. We see people who are saved. Is that what you want this morning? If that's what you want, then we need to act on that. And I would encourage you, if you have a small circle of family, family, or friends, I want to encourage you to enlarge that circle. The more refreshing, the better. There's more family out there. They may never go to this church. They may not have a church. Go find them. Knock on some doors. Help with some projects. Volunteer to fix a car that's... Oh, never mind. If you don't know how to do that, don't do that. Uh, volunteer to help around the house. Volunteer. Help people out. Put yourself into other people's lives. Take that risk. That's what Jesus did for me. That's what Jesus did for you. He took that risk and spoke into your life, and you had the choice to accept or reject Him. I believe most of you here, from what you've told me, you've accepted Him. I don't know everyone's story here. Maybe everyone here has accepted Him. Maybe you rejected Him a couple times before you accepted Him. And yet he still kept coming back. Can we keep that same attitude in increasing our family? God's given you unlimited family. Will you take advantage of it? Or will you run dry 
substituting the counterfeit. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we've come here because we need you. We've come here because you called us here. Lord, I pray for everyone here this morning. They have come here because you called them here. Maybe they had their own mental reasons, but there's something more going on. You are working, and I pray, Lord, that you open their eyes to what it is you're doing. Not what they're doing, not what other people are doing, but what you're doing. Dear God, thank you so much for this family, and I pray, Heavenly Father, that we allow people to pour into us, and we pour into others, and we reach out and invite new family members, anyone who's willing to do your will and seek after you. Thank you for your work on the cross and saving us to this work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.